welcome to the first presentation of the newly merged Brandy Potter books and written by magazine. Today we are going to talk about a subject that I have heard and read debated so many times, the big four in writing. These are violence, sex, alternative lifestyles, and rude language. This is a long presentation, I apologize for that, but coming out of the starting gate, I wanted to produce my most viewed and talked about blog post. I promise going forward that the presentations will be shorter and less heavy. But before we get started, just a quick disclaimer. This is not a religious debate. I feel there are three things that a public figure should never discuss, sports, politics, and religion, unless, of course, they relate to the person's public persona, like a politician, athlete, or religious figure. So please understand I am treading in waters that I am not comfortable being in. You cannot have this debate without religious references, however. So without revealing too much of my lifestyle, my political or religious preferences, I am going to use arguments that I have heard so often between my fellow authors and reviewers alike. I am going to use some Christian perspectives because that is the viewpoint I have heard from the most. It's not that I am discriminatory against any religion. It's just that I refuse to speak to something I am not familiar with. And I happen to know my way around the Bible, having used it in debates with unchristian Christians before. You know the type. This is a discussion about writing. Post-discussion must remain strictly to the topic, the big four in writing. Everything else will be deleted. I am not going to subject myself or my followers to any discrimination. There is more than one version of the Bible. I will be using the King James Version. Also, there is more than one interpretation of biblical text. I am using my interpretation. We are not discussing children's books, young adult novels, or nonfiction. These have their own rules for the big four. So are violence, sex, alternative lifestyles, and rude language appropriate in writing? I don't know if I have the specific answer to that, but I can present my own point of view. Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. There are so many people looking to censor things because people today seem to get offended by small issues. Rating systems are fine with me. They don't remove the creative processes of writing or the creative freedom. As a parent, they're helpful. If the government wanted to put a rating systems on books, I personally would be okay with that. And a certain amount of warning for some things like the big four is okay. Because of my post-traumatic stress disorder, reading a book with a violent act that is just way over the top can seriously disturb me. But honestly, do we not have common sense? If you don't like this stuff, don't pick up erotica, thriller, suspense, or horror novels and expect them not to have some of these things. I don't read erotica. Sure, I read and write steamy scenes, but nothing that makes me feel like I need a shower afterward. I also don't have anything against erotica. I read a blog post that stated that all books with the big four in them in any form were evil and that we have had enough evil. And then the blog called on writers of goodness to write only about truth, integrity, and probity, among many other things. I can feel the righteousness surging. Hey, you want to have a rousing discussion about truth, honor, patriotism? These are all amiable traits that deserve literary representation. If there is not a villain, how can there be a hero? I mean, Captain America is great, but how boring would life be if we were all Captain America? Not to mention, there wouldn't be a Hulk, and let's face it, Batman's existence would be highly questionable. As a reader, if there's an exorbitant amount of anything, including long drawn out descriptions that have nothing to do with the character or story development, I hate it. This includes the big four. Some stories need violence or sex or what have you. I don't like gratuitous measures of any of it. As you write, decide, does this really need to be here? Does the story make sense without it? If it does, then take it out. If it doesn't make sense without it, edit it to make sure it's not gratuitous. But on the flip side, as an author, I often feel stifled. When I'm writing a book like Venomous Lives, which is about glam rock in the 80s, a world populated by notorious and infamous drug addicts and sex fiends, it's hard to come to a clean version of the story. 
The type of people my characters represent are rockers. They played hard, fought hard, and rocked hard, and had sex, drugs, and rock and roll by the metric ton almost every day of their lives. I find that I will write a scene that flows freely and completely, and then I censor it to appease others to the point where it loses its power. And these are all creative differences. Not all of us are monotheistic. Some of us aren't istic at all. Our religious and moral makeup dictates our brand and the style we have. Therefore, not every book is written for everyone to read. Oh, sure, that's our dream. But let's get real, shall we? Does it not say in Ecclesiastes 3.1, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven? A time to be born, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to keep silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. And for those of you keeping score out there, yes, I skipped a few of the time twos in this quote. It is a long quote. That's a long time. Remember the joy you felt as a child when Dorothy opened the door to Munchkin Land and the black and white disappeared and everything was in Technicolor? There is more to life than black and white. True, there are shades of gray, but more importantly, there are brilliant reds, cool blues, deep purples, and these are what makes the world and life beautiful. Nothing is totally good or totally evil. Genghis Khan abolished torture and embraced religious freedom and diversity in his kingdom. He ran his kingdom as a meritocracy, which means that the elite earned their positions. He loved learning and strove to increase literacy among the Mongol nation. He advanced the rights of women in his society and brought Chinese medicine to his people. In their time, Chinese medicine was the most advanced. Thomas Jefferson owned 600 slaves. He had a long-standing affair and six children with one of them. Her name was Sally Hemings. In his lifetime, he only freed two slaves, neither of which were Sally. In his will, he freed five more. Two of his sons were Sally, but not Sally. He did allow three others to run away with his consent. His daughter and last remaining son alive with Sally, but not Sally. He never freed Sally. Pablo Escobar supported community philanthropic efforts. In Moravia, he built over a thousand homes. He created clean water and sewage systems. He built airports, sports arenas, and a free zoo for the people of his area. He even gave poor families in Medellin a medical budget so they could have better medical care. Aristotle was sexist. He believed that women should be ruled by men. While he did allow that they were above slaves, he felt it was only marginally so. He is quoted as saying, just as it sometimes happens that deformed offspring are produced by deformed parents and sometimes not, so the offspring produced by a female are sometimes female and sometimes not, thus stating that women are just deformed men. Emperor Hirohito is a celebrated marine biologist. He wrote several books on the subject. He also aided in classification of marine life. Over 128,000 species were sent to him and his two staff biologists to be identified. Martin Luther was an anti-Semite. He wrote three works on the subject titled On the Jews and Their Lies, Von Schem Hamporas und Vom Geschlicht Christi, which translates to Of the Unknowable Name and the Generations of Christ, and Warning Against the Jews. He called for the burning or destructions of synagogues, schools, houses, and the removal of Jewish holy works. He pushed to have all the wealth taken from them and safe passage revoked on the highways as they had no right to either of these. He then felt that they should be used for hard labor or ejected from the country. Any of that sound familiar? 
Theoretically, in an ideal world, evil and misfortune would not exist. Everyone would be happy and whole and complete. There wouldn't be war or suffering. But would we be complete? What is light without God? Would we really be happy? Would we even know what happy meant? Without evil and misfortune to illustrate what makes us happy, how would we know? We're also going against our animal instincts and makeup to turn the other cheek, to submit and be good all of the time. We are all animals, my lady. Most are too afraid to see it. I am so sorry that I use him so much, but what a great representation of evil and darkness. And it's Tim Curry. Come on, Tim Curry. Okay, I'm digressing. I have three questions for you. If you are monotheistic and your muse sends you on a path with your writing, is that not your deity or God telling you to go that direction? And when you question it, do you question it as you are writing it or when you reread it with your personal values? And finally, God is against war, right? Let's talk about some wars that were fought for theological or religious reasons. The Crusades, the Reconquista, the German Peasants' War, the French War of Religion, the British Civil War, specifically the Irish Campaigns, the Ottoman Wars, the Thirty Years' War, the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, the Croatian War, and the Bosnian War. The list goes on and on. However, in historical perceptions, some were vilified and some were made heroes. Why? Can we not agree that both the winners and the losers felt righteous or justified? Hitler was wrong for the attempted annihilation of several cultures. Why weren't Andrew Jackson or Oliver Cromwell? Jackson and Cromwell felt that they were protecting their countries, and as a Cherokee and an Irish woman, that takes a lot of pain to give them, I tell you. It's the historical judgments that shape our view of these events, and it's history that decides the righteous. Make no mistake, we have no idea what judgments were placed upon any of those mentioned by a higher power. We can assume, based upon our own faiths, but which one of us is right? Me? You? The guy reading this in Muskogee? The lady in Cairo? The other guy in Kathmandu? Or the chick in Bangladesh? Who knows? It depends on the character's conviction and point of view. Let's look at some characters that were villainous but were acting on their perception of righteousness. Silas in the Da Vinci Code felt he was protecting his God, just like Henry VIII or Mary I. Snape was mean to Harry because Harry looked so much like his father James, who had bullied Snape horribly. Cersei Lannister does everything she does for her family and for her children. Fagin provides a home for children who would end up in a poorhouse, like Oliver was in the beginning of the book. Magua, in The Last of the Mohicans, is fighting the Greyhairs because they killed his wife and children. How about these characters, who were terrible people, but were seen as the heroes or heroines of their stories? Daisy is a sociopath. She is able to fake emotions to get what she wants. For example, she only pretends to love Gatsby to get her revenge on Tom. She has absolutely no remorse after killing Myrtle, and even less when Gadsby is killed for her crime. Anna Karenina abandons her children to pursue an adulterous affair. V is crazy. He is just as one-sided as Sutler or Creedy. He believes that blowing up Parliament and having people killed in the name of revolution is the way to do things. Oh, Tyler, 
We all love Tyler. The narrator is so boring and stuffy. And then Bob dies. And then suddenly we are all, whoa, free to main free. My personal favorite, he's a mafia don. Come on. The question you need to ask yourself is what creates or perpetuates violence? Passion, rage, crime, money, psychosis, zealotry, religious or otherwise. Then you need to ask yourselves which one of these would it take for your character to use violence? So what can you as an author do to decide how much, if any, violence you put in your book? Here are some things to keep in mind. What is the purpose of your story? Is it the story of a child who triumphs over abuse? In Honest Illusions by Nora Roberts, you hear that the hero has been abused for much of the book. You hear descriptions of scars that he has when he is an adult. And as a child, he describes the abuse to a point, but using a child's perspective. Things are missed, skipped, glossed over, or simply alluded to. But in a book like Bastard Out of Carolina, you have to hear the abuse as it is happening. It is the driving force of the plot and of the main character and why every other character makes the choices that they make. If the focus of the story is not on the abuse, then the abuse doesn't need to be detailed. Is it a serial killer story? I feel that for serial killer stories, you have to have a certain amount of violence, at least in the description of the crime. And they have to be a little bit shocking because it's a serial killer. However, you can do it tastefully. In The Bride Collector by Ted Decker, Ted Decker takes a moment to describe the crimes from the killer's perspective. And even though he drills holes in their feet and drains their blood, the killer does it lovingly and ritualistically. And when the bodies are discovered, the killer has cleaned up the gore so it's not there. Is it a rape or murder story? Again, unless it's happening in the moment and is the driving force, you can tell the story in flashbacks. If you know anything about psychology, then you know that a victim will only remember so much. They will block out the actual act. They may see a face or hear a voice. They might remember a metallic smell or someone standing over the body if they witness the murder or are the ghost of the victim. This is selective memory, and it is the brain's way of coping with trauma. In The General's Daughter, you never see the whole gang rape played out in a sequence. You see glimpses here and there, and you piece it together, and in that way, Nelson DeMille does not horrify his audience. Don't have a gloom and doom character. No one, and I do mean no one, has such a terrible life that nothing good happens. They may see life that way, but it's not true. If nothing good happens to them in the story, then when they are killed or kill themselves, the audience doesn't find it horrific. You can't have a victim tortured the entire book and expect the audience to be shocked and appalled when they die. Think about it. When someone here in the real world dies with a terminal illness, we say at least they aren't suffering anymore. The same is true in a story. Your readers will see it as the character's release from suffering. If your characters have nothing to live for, they are not going to care if they die. Now, the character could have had nothing to live for to begin with, and then find something in the story, like Myrtle in The Great Gatsby, but there has to be something positive in their lives if you want them to be shocked by their death. Number three, you have to have a positive to negate the negative. If you have a rape scene, you have to have a consensual loving sex scene. If you have a horrible abusive marriage, you have to have a positive relationship. In Secrets, Jane is abused by her husband, but then has a wonderful relationship with another man. And even in my own book, Venomous Lives, Juliet has a great relationship with one husband and a horrible one with another. Domestic abuse is really a tricky tragedy. Having strong 
partners who receive the abuse does not negate the violence. You have to have justice for the violence. In Venomous Lives, Juliet is faced with spousal abuse. She doesn't take it lying down, but she also gets justice. If the woman or man gets beaten and there is no justice or point to it, it is there for shock value. And as a survivor of domestic violence, I would find that offensive. And if I had bought your book or was reviewing your book, I would make sure that that was in my review. Children too. In Bastard Out of Carolina, Bone gets away from her abuser and finds a good home, but she never gets traditional justice. For this reason, the book has been deemed shocking and horrific and met with a lot of criticism. That is not to say that in the real world everyone gets justice. They don't. But when you are writing, you have to give the victims something. Number five, killing a character to save the book. I know that some live by the adage that if the book is dragging, kill a main character. And I don't know about you, but I think that's wrong. That is stupid. Why would you kill a main character just to save the book? I killed a character in some of my books. I did it because it was a catalyst for something else. That is the only reason to kill a character. Let's talk about sex, baby. I so was not dancing in my chair right there. I lie. So many people treat sex like it's the plague. It, sex is good, and even several monotheistic religions feel that not engaging in sex is a sin. In the Old Testament, it says that celibacy is a sin because man was not made to be celibate. Admittedly, it says you should be married first, and many of us don't marry first. However, if that's your position, then don't have extramarital sex in your story. The Bible says that sex is bad if you abuse it. It also says that sex is glorifying God if used for the reason for its creation. With the exception of adultery, it is not in the Ten Commandments. And hey, if you aren't married, you can't commit adultery, right? I know, I'm arguing a technicality. Know what? Even the Bible knows that sex sells. It has some of the most titillating lines of erotica I have ever read. Does Song of Solomon ring a bell? Let me just list a few quotes, shall I? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. This one makes my blood boil and not in a good way. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. And the most descriptive one of all, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. We are all sexual beings. We know about it, talk about it, and think about it. The majority of us compare notes and experiences. The manner that we compare is different. Some of us are blunt and honest, say it like it is. Some of us are subtle and shy. Still, there are some things about sex that make us all go, ew like in elementary school kids. There are things we can do as authors that can curb the general ickiness of it. So here are some rules to love by. Number one, it's all in the approach. There are basically three ways to write a sex scene. You can approach it as an action scene. You can make it a scene about how it feels or both. There is no in between. If you want a more metaphorical approach, do it from the feeling side. If you want to be more technical about it, approach it from the physical side. 
Personally, I find that the hybrid model seems to work the best for illusions and fade to blacks, which is my personal preference. Don't get me wrong, I have go all the way scenes when needed, but that's a different topic on the list. Long flowery words for the primal urge. So the next two are gonna seem contradictory and perhaps should be in the same category, but I separated them for a reason. There are only so many ways to represent human body parts. Big, long SAT words are not the way to go. Once, I actually read a novel that used the word eggplant to describe something that absolutely should not ever be remotely described in that way. And it doesn't even sound appealing. And then there are the people who say things like, his turgent tumescence pressed into the dewy folds of her efflorescent humectation. Okay... He inserted tab A into slot B is hardly romantic, but that wording just makes me go, hmm, y'all know me, so you know what's coming next. Things that make you, mm -hmm. Things that make you go, mm -hmm. Number three, most of us are not OBGYNs. For as much as we don't like tumescence, we do not want to hear that the estrogen began to flow from her whatever gland, releasing endorphins that made her body have small rhythmic convulsions while the testosterone in his system caused his semen to simultaneously be released into her uterus, causing them both to, okay, shut the up. Just stop. That's horrible. Number four, sex is like a story or a song. Songs and stories and sex have a progression. They have a beginning, middle, containing conflict, climax, and an end. Or if we're talking about a song, verse, chorus, bridge, end. You have to have a rhythm to it, a plot. It has to make sense and flow like a catchy tune or a well-written story or a poem. Ironically, or perhaps not, fight scenes are like that too. But I digress again. I do that a lot. Number five, porn does not a romance make. Do I really have to alliterate on this? Yes? Okay, then. Here goes. Porn, like Facebook, is not real life. Here is the synopsis of every porn film ever. People say the dumbest things. And then other people trust them to do disgusting things to them. No woman that I know wants to hear or have done to her what is being done in those movies. In fact, we sit there and put funny dialogue over the top of them and laugh at parties. No, really, we did that in college. Men supposedly dream of a woman that will do all of those things, but I tell you... She or he had better not do them before they get married, or even after, because the man will just have instant horror vibe on. Of course, this is not always true, but most of my alternative lifestyles friends are like, um, yeah, no. So don't look to porn. Look to your characters. Look to real life. In Venomous Lives, one couple is insanely passionate. And while I have them make love in several places, it never plays out like a porn film. It's what their relationship is like. Number six, more than sex. Sex in a book should read like the best night of sex you have ever had in your entire life. The romance, the kissing, the foreplay, the cuddling, the sleeping the morning after. You can't just have them have sex and be done. That goes back to number five. If you have a main character that has a one-night stand, allude to it. Do not take four pages to describe it. If you do, when the whole book is finished, readers will say to themselves, that's X amount of my life that I can't get back. Sex should be part of the motivation, the undercurrent, the subtext. It shows the personality of not just your characters, but the relationships between them. 
Real sex reads like a sitcom. People laugh during sex. Funny things happen. People fall off beds. They spill wine. Their kids walk in. Write it. Use it. See no, hear no, write no evil. Treat a sex scene like it's just another scene, just like Nora Roberts said in her quote at the beginning of this section, because it is. If you are a moral person, you will handle it with the care it needs. You never have to say any more than he kissed her gently, took her hand, and led her to the bedroom. Or he kissed him, blah, blah, blah. Or she kissed her, blah, blah, blah. The audience will know what happened. But if you want to put in a steamy scene, then treat it like it's another scene. Then there is no evil. Will they? Won't they? No. It's should they. Do you know what I hate? Authors who throw antagonists in the sack for sexual tension. That's not sexual tension. That's ridiculous. I have spent the larger part of 17 years arguing with someone and despising their very name. I know I will never end up in bed with him, ever. And I know certain characters won't either. And authors do it all the time, but so do directors and screenwriters. And even if two characters seem to have a desire for each other, that doesn't mean they should be together either. How bad did this show suck after Dave and Maddie slept together? Or how about the couple that never had an attraction for each other and then blam? For me, it's much more romantic to have star-crossed lovers. They're a perfect match, but something keeps them apart. Or... They get together, but eventually they have to make a hard choice to do what is best. Too much like the Tudor family or too much like the Cleaver family for your story? Think about your genre, your setting, your plot. Will the sex scene move the plot forward? Would subtlety better serve? Could you get away with suggestions? Are your characters being true to themselves? For example, you are writing a fast-paced spy flick. You need a sex scene because that is what James Bond does, damn it. Okay, so in this instance, you don't want a long, drawn-out scene. On the other hand, if you have spent the entire book building the sexual tension and the reader gets two sentences of the entire act with no fade to black, that's it, done. Consider yourself hung by your toes. On the other hand... If you suddenly have a sex scene with no purpose, you will fall prey to the joke that my sister and I always had during movies. Well, there it is. Pointless, unneeded sex scene. Time to get a drink and come back. Now let us address alternative lifestyles. Many people feel that if you have an alternative lifestyle, you are depraved and horrible. Even worse, they often believe that people that engage in alternative sexualities deserve their fates and make perfect victims. Let's look at some examples. Since she is a prostitute and a sadomasochist and Joyce's would-be murderer is a police officer, many feel Joyce had it coming. Because Catherine is bisexual, she is portrayed as manipulative, non-committal, and even the perfect murderer. It is implied that Bill starts killing because he has refused a sex change operation, therefore making a stereotype of transsexuals as depraved. Danny is a homosexual prostitute that services one of Savannah society's most prominent and well-loved people. The focus on Jim's sexuality is almost nil, but the entire town degrades Danny for being both gay and a prostitute. Tracy is a transvestite who falls in love with a married man who kills his wife rather than confess to her that he is gay and in love with Tracy. Tracy is then arrested and accused of being accomplice to the crime because the police and court can't believe that another man would do that to be with a man dressed as a woman.
If we believe whatever God we believe in creates all of us, then if he or she creates someone who loves a member of the same sex, who are we to judge? If someone doesn't identify with their own body so much that they need to become the opposite sex, what business is it of ours? To my knowledge, according to Christian canon, the only requirement to gain entrance to heaven is the belief in Christ. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26:28. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 10.43 You would think the way that some people behave that alternative lifestyles are the worst sin known to man, but even the so-called deadly sins are forgiven. They are stated in Proverbs 6.16-19 through 19 as... These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Wait. Those aren't the deadly sins. But they are. Did you know that? The seven deadly sins were created by Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century. They are not in the Bible. However, they are pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. I'm a looking, but I don't see alternative lifestyles in there, do you? Lust is all inclusive, and that means heterosexual extramarital relations as well. So that's rather like the pot calling the kettle, and thus not a valid argument in this discussion. So, no matter whether you are Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, pagan, or even just a humanist, we are supposed to live and let live. If you are uncomfortable, then put the book down, change the channel, and let the appropriate authority judge them, and absolutely do not stereotype them. For originality, why not make the hooker the hero detective? Or the sadomasochist the helpful neighbor? Some people that are highly intelligent and successful engage in alternative sexuality, and hey, let's face it, nobody knows what Sherlock Holmes' sexuality was, really. If you're going to portray an alternative lifestyle in your writing, research it. If you can't stomach that, then don't write it. Period. End of discussion. Do you know the difference between transgender and a transvestite? No? Then don't write about either. Gay men don't always have a wife and a husband. In other words, one isn't always more feminine or more masculine than the other. Contrary-wise, I have known beautiful, fashionable lesbian couples where both are clearly feminine. I know bisexual couples that have committed relationships. Sometimes they have an outside member. Sometimes they don't. I know people in open marriages that have definitive rules and violations that are considered cheating. BDSM folks aren't all leather and straps and they don't all have tattoos and piercings. Not everyone with tattoos or other body modifications has an alternative lifestyle beyond that. Not all drag queens or drag kings are gay. Unfortunately, the alternative lifestyles have distinct stereotypes that are way overplayed. Sometimes they are used as comic relief tastefully, like in the birdcage, and you can also have eccentric characters because they do exist and are tastefully represented like in the Midnight of Gar in the Garden of Good and Evil. But lesbians are often women who dress in flannel and look like men. Homosexual men are often portrayed as being eccentric and feminine. 
Practitioners of BDSM are either too subservient or too overbearing. People who have open relationships and multiple partners are loose and have no morality, or worse that anything goes and the partners have no boundaries. People who are transgender are represented as freaks or liars who try to trick straight members of society into relationships with them. Drag queens and kings so over the top that no self-respecting member of their community would acknowledge them, and bisexuals that are ostracized for having sex with either sex. Too often I see people with alternative lifestyles misrepresented by these stereotypes, or worse, portrayed as sexual deviants, the killers or justifiable victims. The truth is that they are regular people. They can be businessmen, housewives, CEOs, and yes, that is an out and proud CEO right there. They could be your neighbor, your pastor, your family. You would never know unless they told you. You can't identify them by sight. Sexuality is not a trait. It's not a flaw. It's not a personality. Write a character, make them whole, then decide on their sexuality or alternative lifestyle. Do not let the lifestyle dictate the person. Before we debate the should use, let's list the how can use. Profanity means irreligious or irreverent behavior. For language and Christianity, this means taking the Lord's name in vain. Oh. My. God. A curse calls upon a deity or fate to visit harm on someone or something. The Bible says don't use perverted and angry words and not to curse people, but that is the main God strike you down if you don't types of curses. To be damned is to be condemned to hell, and then hell itself can be a vulgar word. The whole damn thing. Hell no. Swears are to proclaim an oath. That is not an example of vulgarity, so it shouldn't be used to describe foul language. I'll find you! I'll get you back and set you free! I swear to God! The next two sections of the presentation have clips with actual cussing in them, as if those didn't. However, they are not the worst of the worst. These are. If you do not wish to hear them, I have some protection built in here for you. There are two ways to do this. If you want to hear the definitions for obscenities and vulgarisms, but not view the examples, I have placed a warning that will flash before the clip. It will look and sound like this. Viewer discretion is advised. If you want to skip the whole thing, fast forward until you see this image flashing. He's safe! Obscenities mean something disgusting, which usually denotes sex or sexual organs. Viewer discretion is advised. Fucking what the fucking fuck? Who the fuck? Fuck this fucking... How did you do fucking fucks? Fuck! Well, it certainly illustrates the diversity of the word. <laughs> Vulgarisms are everything else that falls outside of the first three, but are considered objectionable. Viewer discretion is advised. Not my daughter, you bitch! He's safe! Foul language isn't something that should riddle the story without purpose. Still, if you are reading a crime novel and the criminal comes across like Ned Flanders, you may lose your readers. You have to write believable characters. Sailors, blue-collar workers, all swear. When they don't, they can be seen to be different, so having a dock worker who doesn't swear might make him or her stand out. Venomous Live has cuss words. Rockers cuss. 
I cuss, so it's natural to me. However, I try to use other words or even have them pause and use ellipses to cover their swear words when possible. Or I say, she screamed a stream of expletives at him that would have made a sailor blush. There are ways around it. At the same time, when every other word is an F-bomb, then you sound juvenile. Just be prepared. It appears to me that the F-bomb is more offending to reviewers than every incestuous scene between the Lannister twins in the entirety of the Game of Thrones books put together in one long scene. So we have reached the end, our friend the end, to steal from Jim Morrison. So what have we learned, class? Are violence, alternative lifestyles, foul language okay in writing? When done properly, sure. Should you do it? I can't answer that. The answer is subjective to your point of view, to your beliefs, to your brand, to your story, but most importantly, to your characters. I have three literary children, as I like to call my books. One is an unpublished fantasy novel. It has sword fights and violence, no cuss words. There is a little bit of sex in it, but nothing too gratuitous. However, the book doesn't work without them. Eight Arms is a suspense paranormal romance. It has elements of the big four in it. Minus alternative lifestyles at this point. The book doesn't work without them. And Venomous Lives. All of the big four are represented in Venomous Lives, but also drugs and alcoholism. It is a book about rock and roll. The book doesn't work without them. My final thought for the day goes out to those of you who would criticize people that do use the big four in writing. Just remember that the price of seeking to force your belief on others is that someday they might force their beliefs on you. Thank you so much for joining me for the last 47 minutes or so. I know it's twice as long as any of my other presentations have ever been. Next week, we're going to be talking about stress and writing, hopefully getting you past some of your writer's block so that you can move forward in your stories. And for now, I'm going to leave you with the thought that I always leave you with. Remember to walk without dreams is to walk blind.